Hi guys and welcome to episode 8 of the Northern Rugby Podcast and many thanks for the continued support. Today we're excited to be chatting to Newcastle Falcons most capped hooker of all time, Matt Thompson. So Matt spent 13 years as a professional at Kingston Park, making 250 appearances and helping the team to win the 2004 Power Gen Cup final. Matt was also capped by the England Saxons and was part of the team who won the Churchill Cup in 2007. The Thompson family links run deep with the Falcons as Matt's uh, dad, Dave Thompson, was a Falcons chairman from 1999 until 2011. And Matt tells us what it was like to be a part of the team when his dad was in charge. Matt also talks to us about his debut, his retirement and a massive amount in between. So let's get straight into it and see what Matt had to say. Hey Matt. Hello, how are you? I'm very good, mate. How are you? Not bad, not bad. Sorry about that. That's all right. We got to work it eventually. Yeah. How's uh, how's twenty twenty been treating you? Oh mate, same as everyone else, isn't it? Everyone just wants it to end. Exactly. Oh, it's absolute. Oh, well, unprecedented times, isn't it? And um, but there's a lot worse people off than than me, so I can't really complain that much. How's the uh, how's how's the kids coping with it? Do you know what? They've they've been fine. Uh, I've got eleven year olds uh, and an eight year old. Well, seven uh, eight year old. Sorry, and um, they've been fine. Really, they they're durable kids, and I think they've just um, as long as there's sport on for my two, they're not that bothered. And they've got competitive football, and they're training rugby. So the rugby hasn't started games yet or anything like that. I don't think it will do um, for this season. Uh, but the, apart from that, they're fine. In school, yeah, it's different, but they've forgotten what the norm was. So they yeah. just crack, they've just cracked on, really. They du- kids are durable and they just adapt. Uh, and my two have pretty well, to be honest. So, yeah. Yes. Well, uh, Matt, thanks very much for um, <clears throat> for coming on the podcast with us. It's nice to have you here. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, no problem at all. Typically, what we do is we just chat through um, chat through your career and. Hopefully, hear some stories that people haven't heard before. So, let's go back to the uh, to the very beginning with the young Matt Thompson and uh, and how you wound up as a full time professional and and how you joined the Falcons Academy. So, just, just talk us through it. Um, I mean, uh, yeah. So, uh, f- I used to live in Germany. A lot of people don't know that I was born in Brighton, um, and I used to live in Germany until I was six, and then. Uh, through my dad's work, we moved back to Newcastle, which my mum and dad are originally from. And then he took me to Newcastle Gosforth Rugby Club at the age of six, which was uh, is actually the uh, Newcastle Gosforth turned into Newcastle Falcons. Yep. And uh, the mini rugby side, I used to play on the current Falcons ground, as it is now. <laughs> so from the age of like uh, six to 16, I played at Newcastle Gosforth. Um, and then uh, so and then I went to RGS Royal Grammar School in Newcastle, which is a big rugby playing school. Um, uh, from eight to eighteen, and that's pretty much where I learned how to play rugby. Yeah, um, with a good group of good group of um lads there. I mean, they've produced kind of few um professional rugby players in that time, like current ones, Joel Hodgson. Uh, Will Welsh, uh, I think Fraser Balmain went there as well. Yep. Um, so yeah, w- I went there until I was uh, eighteen and left, and joined. Got asked to join the academy uh, by a bloke called Paul McKinnon, um, who uh, was head of the. It it wasn't so much. It was in a different setup back then. It was like an under twenty one setup. Yeah. So, um, and generally, what you had to do was join a university, um, and go to university, and then you got invited to play under twenty one rugby for uh, for the club. Um, and pretty much at that time, Northumbria University rugby team was Newcastle Falcons under twenty one's team as well. How it was run. So, um, yeah, I went. Uh... And and who who else was in that academy team with you? Um. Phil Dawson was in it for a bit. He he originally went to Leeds and then after a year he got a job I think in Leeds, but then um and played for Leeds, but then he came up um after a year. Jeff Parlin was in it. Um he was a year below me. Uh I think who else? Uh Rory Best was there at university at Newcastle University. 
Um, and that's that's one that people always forget. People have no idea he was actually in Newcastle for a stage and could have been a Falcon. Yeah, so I think he went. Uh, he he went to Newcastle University. He was a medic, uh, not a medic, uh, an agric, sorry. Yeah. And um, he he went there for two years, and then I think Ulster sort of uh, the draw of Ulster with his brothers being over there and stuff like that. He left and went over there, and obviously everyone knows what a great success he made of his career. It was unbelievable. So um, yeah, uh, so he was in that that academy team. And then uh, Toby Flood was through it at, at some point. Matthew Tate. There was a load of younger lads, um, younger than me, that came through that were turned out to be unbelievable rugby players. Yeah, yeah, plenty of talent. And around this time, um, as you're kind of 16, 17 years old, this is when uh, your dad, Dave Thompson, buys the Falcons. Is that right? Yeah. So he retired. Uh, he, he sold a company in uh, London and uh, came up and pretty much he was getting bored in Newcastle. He retired and sitting, playing squash, drinking coffee, doing nothing. And then um, the whole family, Sir John Hall, who uh, used to own Newcastle United, approached him. And at the time that he was trying to build a sort of um, a sporting complex with the, obviously the football the rugby, the basketball, and the uh, the ice hockey, mm-hmm. and he tried to buy all them and build uh, build this sort of um, sporting club. Uh, he spent a lot of money uh, building an amazing team that won the the premiership or whatever it was called back then. But I mean, he had Rob Andrew, Popper Well, Doddy Weir, the works uh, in there. But I think uh, same as everything, I think he didn't see it working long term for him. So he um he looked to sell it on and uh yeah, my dad sort of grasped it at both hands. Uh he was a I mean it was a dream of his, really. He'd uh he'd played rugby all his life. Um uh I mean he played he played for Novos, um and he went to the same school as me, played for RGS and stuff like that and just loved the business side of things, but also hugely the sporting side of things. And to buy a rugby club with Rob ha- Rob Andrew at the at the helm and stuff like that, he, 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 he it was a hobby for him at the time, and he he, he grasped it with both hands really. Yeah. So yeah, he bought it off uh, Sir John Hall and um, went from there. Yeah. And what was that like for you? Obviously, as a, as a young man who's who's thinking of. Maybe going down the professional rugby route. Is what, what was that like for you? Um, it was it, uh, it was exciting. Uh, I didn't really grasp when I was sort of a, a 16, 17, the impact it may have on my life at that time for later on. And uh, but at the time, I was really pleased for him. He he'd sort of um, it was his dream to do this. And uh, you could tell how happy he was and how much he was enjoying it day to day. Uh, the impact when I was 16, 17, it didn't really have an impact. I was just busy playing rugby at school. Uh, later on in life, yes, it did, because um, it was my dream from a six-year-old, being a ball boy in Newcastle, Gosforth and Falcons, that I wanted to play um, for Newcastle Falcons and be a professional rugby player. And move her on in life, yeah, it made it difficult, but like it, 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 it was a challenge. I had opportunities to sort of go other places and uh, play for other teams, but I chose not to, and uh, tr- try and make it a dream of mine to um, play for play my whole career, yeah, which I nearly did. Excellent, and uh. I, I suppose in, in those early days of of, um, of your dad's ownership, the, the club are doing well in the Premiership. They win the uh, the two thousand and one Tetley's Cup. They've got a young kind of this this young core of English players coming through, and then your debut rolls around. So you debut in two thousand and two. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. If you t- if you tell me that date's correct, yeah, I'll believe it. <laughs> and I know who it was against. It was against um, Newport in the cup. Um, so yeah, played uh, Newport in the cup. Um, 
I remember we got our uh, a, a good whopping on that day. I think it was about 40-odd points to very little. And it was almost one of those games where you send the bomb squad down to um, the t- team bin juice down to um, <laughs> sort of fulfil fulfil um, f- fulfil the fixture. And uh, yeah, I I was uh, definitely team bin juice at that time and came off the bench and got my debut down there. So yeah, um, it was an exciting time. Obviously, I'd, uh, I'd I'd got my opportunity actually because I'd gone to university and was playing for the under twenty ones. And there had been uh, a massive injury crisis at Newcastle Falcons. There was, uh, I mean, I, I would have been about fifth or sixth in line to play for the first team mm-hmm. um, in in the club's sort of hooker hierarchy. And I think there was injuries to Ross Nesdale, maybe Steve Brotherston, Billy Bolshin and Mike Howe. And... Um, I think Rob Andrew was looking around going, right, who's left? <laughs> right, we're going to throw this kid in. And, uh, yeah, threw me in. So, from that, when I think there were all pretty long-term injuries as well. So, um, uh, Rob had to sort of take me out of university life, uh, gave me a contract and said, you've got to start training with the first team full-time because I might need you to play um, for the end of the season. So, yeah. Uh, I played. I remember playing in that game. That was not a pleasant, uh, pleasant game to play in. And then I think I moved on, and I might have started. I think I started against Bristol and a cup semi final against Northampton Saints. And as a sort of eighteen, nineteen year old, I remember just sitting there looking, going, "These kids, these these people are absolute legends that I'm playing against. I've watched them on TV." I've watched them in the six, uh, well, the Five Nations back then. Watch, watch them there, and um, what am I doing playing on the same same field as this? It was it was pretty <laughs> surreal to be honest. I remember against Bristol, I was scrummaging against Julian White, and I'm sitting there thinking, "Oh my God, he's gonna sort of kill me here." But it, we were all right. I had a good pack behind me, a really really experienced um, front row with me. And they sort of helped me through things. And, uh, yes, got, got through the first season okay. Really. And then we, we come to the uh, the next season, the, the kind of the O2, the O3 the the season, and you start to get more and more game time. Um, so, so what are you kind of thinking at that point? Are you, are you thinking of becoming a regular starter or are you just still trying to enjoy your rugby as it comes to you? No, I, enjoy, I, I, I was never thinking regular starter then. I knew my age. It was, I mean, you. There's not many sort of nineteen, nineteen, twenty year olds starting regular for a Premiership, especially in the front row. Um, I, I still hadn't really developed as a man then. Um, I was training hard um, with uh, uh, the fitness trainers, asking advice from Rob Andrew and where what I need to get to. And there was a forwards coach there called Andrew Blades, who was uh, really good. He, he went on to be um, the Australian forwards coach. And, um, yeah, I just got my head down. Um, it, I Personally, I, I my father used to say as well, and I knew that I would have to train doubly hard more than anyone else just because of the position I was in and my dad was in. And um, I used to try and do that all the time. Um Extras in the gym, extras outside, throwing the ball, work, working on all aspects of the game, and 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 I, I thought I I I did that to, uh, to my full potential then at that time, yeah. And that's so that that's an interesting point you made about um your your dad giving that advice to you because it must have felt a bit like you know having having your dad as as principal at your school. Um, what what was that like for you? So yeah, um, again we've touched on it. It was always going to be hard. Um, Rob at the time used to sort of give me a lot of advice, Rob Andrew, and, and just say, "Look, get your head down. Just get your head down. Train hard. Don't be late. Don't don't sort of um, do anything you shouldn't be doing, and um, let the rugby do the talking." Um, I also, my dad sort of knew it was going to be difficult for me. So um, 
I befriended a, a bloke called Bob Morton, who was a fitness instructor. He was Steve Black, who uh, was our sort of um, head of S&C at the Falcons. It was his best mate. And uh, I befriended him. He used to take me for extra training and, and, and do everything that I, I needed to be doing to fulfil what I wanted to do. Um, and he was almost like uh, the bloke that I could go and ask advice to that I couldn't go and ask my dad okay. because my dad was chairman. Um, so yeah, he, he 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 was almost at the time like uh, that second second father figure to me, and um, helped me along along the way with the things that my dad couldn't couldn't be seen to be doing. Um, and that relationship at the time worked worked pretty well. And then he got Bob Morton got brought in with Steve Black to be part of the fitness uh, regime at Newcastle Falcons, and um, uh, and and that relationship went well as well. So yeah, it was it, at the time it was difficult. I used to have to sort of get my head down and train. I was training sometimes with the under twenty ones, the first team, and Northumbria some days if I if if, if I had to, and and that's just how it was. And I didn't really know any different. So, well, it, 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 it got it, on and did it. It's good that you had that that kind of secondary figure to go to. Uh, yeah, to it, 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 it massively helped. It massively helped because there was there was times where, yeah, I found things difficult, and instead of going to going to my father, who would be possibly stuck between a rock and a hard place, I had a a, a sort of a, a I would call him a wise old man <laughs> to 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 go to 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 ask advice. He would also ask advice of Steve Black. Who everyone knows what he's done in his career and yeah. who he's guided, and uh, yeah, that that helped me along the way from a from a very young age, and um, I had that relationship pretty much all the way through my career with with Bob. Um, so yeah, it was, fantastic. Yeah, and in those uh, in those kind of early years, was there a um, a certain player within the squad that kind of took you under his wing and, and guided you on and off the pitch? So uh, from a uh, there was from a young age. Um, I really learned a lot of people front row wise, like uh, Marius Herter, who was the tight uh, Southampton tight end. Scrummaging wise, he was unbelievable. George Graham, in my first year, was a brilliant. Um, really helped me along the way. But I would say throughout my career, the one bloke that helped me was Mickey Ward. So, and obviously he's now uh, head coach in Newcastle Falcons. He he was always a bloke you could go and talk to about anything. He, uh, he still is with all the young kids at Newcastle Falcons. And um, yeah, he helped me a lot. Um, funnily enough, he'd been, he'd uh, from a young age wanted to become a coach. And I think from the age of sort of 18, 19, he was my coach when I was 14, 15, because he used to do county, county coaching. And um, so I had a, a that, coach um player coach relationship with him then and then when he when I came at the first team he kind of still well I still had that with him so I could ask him anything uh and 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 he helped us all the time really uh Rob Andrew was good so he always used to sort of his door was always open I used to go in have a bit chat with him ask him what I needed to be doing uh yes that relationship there was always always pretty pretty good and you mentioned, um, obviously, a, a lot of props there. You've been in the front row your whole career, but you've you've done a bit of propping as well. Is that right? Yeah, that was a, that was an experiment that went really badly wrong. So um, uh, it was, I think, it was under Alan Alan Tate when he was manager. So it might have been two thousand and nine, ten ish. He um, we had a couple of um, injuries in the prop department, and uh, it, it was they asked me um to fill in uh for a couple of games and um I played against wasps in one game and it went okay and then uh, and then I played against Leeds the second game and uh it just went all wrong I was playing loose head I don't think I, I think I gave away up upwards of sort of 10 penalties and then, oh. and then uh, I dis had dislocated my shoulder on the last one, and that that was that little project over and done with. So yeah, and then I was out for about six, seven months with uh, 
with them um, that torn cartilage and dislocated shoulder. So uh, it was only it only lasted two games, um, and it wasn't it wasn't the best of experiments uh, for my career moving forward. Really, just uh, explain to people what's that like because I when I played I was a fullback, so I know nothing of the forwards. But a lot of people are quite uh, ignorant of the front row and they think, oh, if somebody plays prop, they can play hooker. And if somebody's a loose head, they can play tight head and vice versa. Just just try and, in layman's terms, explain how hard that is to do. Oh, uh, yeah. So um, the scrummaging from hooker, I went from hooker to loose head. So um, I obviously had two people on either, excuse me, my dog's just coming in. That's all right. The little British bulldog is snorting away. <laughs> Um, so I I went from um, uh, hooker to to loose head in this experiment, and um, you've got you've got two people binding on you. You you are, are, are sort of cushioned into the scrum, um, and you can't fall out the sides. Uh, when you're loose head, uh, it's a very different skill. So if you think about it, you're hitting and you've got nothing on your left hand side of your body, and if you get it wrong. You see it quite a lot in the Premiership. You either fall down or your hips fall to the side, and um, the the scrum collapses. Well, I uh, that takes years and years of career to master, and uh, I only had a couple of months, and it didn't go well for me. But saying that, um, what I would say is uh, Rob Vickers did it very well. He moved from hooker Falcons to loose head uh, at the end of his career, and. He was. He did really well at Lucid. Um Great, great player in both positions for them. So it, he obviously mastered it and uh, did really well for himself. Yeah. Yeah, it I looks think... like they're um, for the season ahead. They're, they're trying to do the same thing with Cal Cooper. So he, he's been, yeah, he's been moved quite, to quite possibly. He's he is uh, from what I've seen a very, very dynamic front row player. Great ball carrier. Um, sort of quick on his feet. So I hope it goes well for him. Yeah. Um, they've got enough hookers to be fair. So they'll the have a look at him at loose head. And I know Mickey Wardle sort of have him, have him uh, practicing every day and hopefully that will work well for him. Yes. But yes. To, uh, to go back to your earlier days, then we, um, we get through the 03, or sorry, the 02, 03 season. We come to 03, 04 and the Falcons wind up making a cup final. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the, the, uh, that was, that was a, uh, Sort of one of the the best memory early memories of my Falcons career that um, that day. Um, we were we were reasonably fortunate at the time of how we progressed into that cup final, because uh, a lot of people can't remember that we were thought we were preparing to play Wasps in a semi final, and they, I don't know how they did it, but they lost to I think what they call it was Birmingham team. So was it per temps per temps bees, yeah. Yeah, they lost in the semi-final uh, with all their superstars on the pitch to Perth Thamesbees. So we ended up playing a semi-final against them, um, which we progressed through to. Uh, and then, obviously, full house at Twickenham against Sale, which was uh, sort of that. That was that. That was the first real game where you're playing in front of out played in front of sort of eighty thousand people at Twickenham, and I just thinking wow this is unbelievable um so I was on the bench for that and Nick Macon um Fulton Suka started and then um it was it was up there with one of the most exciting finals um there's ever been in a cup final because the the score line was just two and throwing two and throwing Dave Walder kicking the goals Charlie Hodgson sort of coming back uh, um, yeah, there was. I mean, there was. There was. A, the, it, it, it was so exciting, and then um, at the end, all I remember really is we were on the line on their line. Phil Dowson's picking it up, and then we just every our whole packs just latched on him and somehow drove him over. Thought the game was won, and then the, the referee says there's three more minutes left. So the, <laughs> the the last three minutes was the most nerve wracking I think I've ever been. Um, yeah, it was to a, see us over the line. It, yeah, it was a builder of a game. We had uh, Tom May was on the podcast with us last time, and we were talking yeah. about the game. And um, the, the the full match is actually on YouTube now. If you want to go back and watch it, well, so I, so funnily, I funnily enough, uh, my son obviously he flicks through YouTube all the time and stuff like that. And um, uh, the other day he was watching it, and I found him watching it, 
Um, so yeah, he was he was quite a proud little son there, seeing seeing a uh, a twenty four year old dad playing at Twickenham. So yeah, yeah, it was an absolute uh, belter of a game, and and that that cup final win, um, also meant the Falcons got into the Heineken Cup the following season. Uh, yeah, uh, that was again that was a, a, another tough sort of um, battle run, run of games uh, that were had. Um, you had so just I'm just looking at the group now. So you, you got some um, revenge on Newport. So you beat them twice. Yeah, we got we had Newport, we had Perpignan, was it? And I think we had Edinburgh. That's correct. Yeah. Um, so obviously in that group, Perpignan with a with a sort of danger danger boys. Um, they they had a very very good squad. But saying that at the start of the year, uh, we invest like the club. Invested heavily in a load, a massive pack. All I remember is the the start of the season, sitting there thinking, "Wow, these boys that we've signed are huge." So it was like Colin Charvis, I think we signed him. Corey Harris, uh, Macca, who you previously had on the podcast yeah, as well. Good lad. Yeah, Luke Gross. Um, he was a, a big American dude, the na- six foot ten bloke, nicest, nicest rugby player you could ever meet. If you got on the wrong side of him. You, you just run for your life. <laughs> Another one like that was Andy Perry. I think we signed him uh, that year. Um, ex Royal Marine Commando, second row. He had bigger biceps than most people's legs. Um, Andy Long, uh, good uh, England international hooker. And there was Robbie Morris as well. So the pack, we just, we, we, I think we we looked at it and just went right. We've got to have massive pack, and I think they. Rob, well, Rob did his job about buying the biggest, meanest rugby players they could to try and fulfil that and compete in that Heineken Cup. So, um, yeah, we started off there. In Perp- uh, I think we went to Perpignan first and got an absolute tank. Uh, if I'm right, I think we lost something uh, 30-odd, 30, 30 10 or something like that. Are we Close, you were 33-12. Th- right, OK. And uh, I remember... We lost Andy Buist to an ACL and Johnny Wilkinson to an ACL as well. Or a suspected ACL. Um, yeah, so the, we we uh, we took a good lick in that day and um, came off the worst with a load of injuries. But I thought we, I think we, I mean, we fought back. We beat Edinburgh home and away, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, where, where, I mean, Newport, well, we played them. And it was the worst, worst day of rugby. It was actually quite similar. It brought back memories. Recently, the Falcons went down there and you couldn't see the lines on the pitch because it was that muddy. <laughs> and, uh, and it was a similar It was a similar day. I don't know. All I remember is seeing Will Welsh just covered in mud and you, you didn't know what shirt he was wearing um, in that recent game. And it was quite similar down there. And we won 10-6. But I remember uh, Luke Gross got into a fight with Ian Goff and I was the closest person next to it next to it and I thought should I go and break it up I ran in and then realized how big they were <laughs> and, and they were throwing some absolute haymakers and I just thought nah I'll just let them get on with it and they both they both got reds so uh yeah remember that uh but we won that 10-6 um which put us in good stead really and I think then we played Perpignan at home, the last game of the the um, the group stage, and won that uh, twenty points, maybe twenty points of fifteen or something like that. But it was Matt Burke, and it I still people still talk about it around the club. I know Mick Hogan talked about it recently. The chief exec saying um, that they they went clean through, and all he had to do was uh, their player was put the ball down, and Matt Burke put in a try save and tackle behind the line, knocked himself clean out, split his head clean open, but won us the game. And it's one of the best tackles I've ever seen. And the, the fans at the Falcons still talk about that today. And unfortunately, Berkey couldn't remember a thing that he'd done because <laughs> he knocked himself clean out. Oh, he was a legend, Berkey, wasn't he? Quality player. Yeah. Oh, man, best, uh, for me, best player I've ever played with. Um, uh, yeah, he's unbelievable talent. So natural. And everything that he did, um, he could just sort of 
walk on the pitch, what you boys trying to do, and do it straight away, and then hand the ball back and go, good luck, good luck, <laughs> good luck practicing that, boys. Um, yeah, but he uh, saying that he do he, he put his hand to any kind of sport. I remember we had an end of season sort of um, uh, piss up session, and it was a, a cricket game, forwards versus backs. And he hit a ton, hit a hundred, easy, sixes everywhere, and then just walked into the bar. Thank you very much. Football, he was awesome at football. He was just so such a naturally talented football um sportsman that uh, yeah, but obviously rugby he was very, very special at. And uh... so yeah, and then and then that season we went on I think quarter final and played mm-hmm. um Stad. And that was another that was another sort of memory of mine similar to the cup final, Pouge and Cup final, of playing in the what what's it called now? The the Paris Saint Germain Stadium. Is it Stade de France? That's the one, yeah. Yeah, played in the Stade de France. Um uh there, but like the whole day was just brilliant uh, from start to finish. We uh, apart from the result obviously. But we uh remember having a hair raising sort of journey to the ground with a police escort and the bus is going around corners on two wheels. <laughs> and the whole city, the whole city was jam packed and we're going around the Shores of Lise on two wheels. And I'm sitting there saying, what is going on here? Got to the ground, can, can girls greeting us in the stadium, pink flags everywhere. It was just, they know, they know how to sort of entertain and, 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 and do a, a, um, a big spectacle. And they did, they did that day. It was amazing. Yeah, we had yeah. um we, we had Matt Burke on before and we were talking about this game and he says it's um it's it's quite disheartening from a Newcastle point of view when you see like a uh you know, half the French pack goes off at sixty minutes, but then the half that's coming on have more international caps than the guys going off. Yeah. I mean I, I actually looked up the team for this and they had I mean what was he called? Olivier Sarah Sarah mm-hmm. I think it was the fullback, scored four tries. David Scrella was ta- uh, t- there was uh, David Aradu, Remy Martin, Liebenberg, Julian Arias, Berger Masco came off the bench. Uh, Glass P shot was playing. Blaine was playing. They just had uh, they, they they were the Real Madrid of rugby at the time, and um, the scoreline uh, definitely definitely um, showed that. And I think we got beaten by fifty points. Uh, but as well, we had sort of Colin Chavis missing, Johnny Wilson missing. I know, th- 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 but within our team, they were huge misses, uh, especially leadership wise, and that showed on the day. Really, we had a, a, a good young, talented team, but nothing compared to their sort of seasoned internationals and, and, and Galacticos, so to speak. Yeah. Well, at least I mean, you're uh, you're part of Falcons history. You're, you're still a part of the team that's got the furthest in the Hannigan Cup. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I won't be bragging about that though because we got the quarter final and got absolutely tonked. I remember that day, Peter Walton. Uh, I think it was Peter Walton, the, the forwards coach. It might have been. Uh, I can't remember. I know they they were going absolutely crazy at the referee because the new rule had come in where that we knew we were going to get absolutely destroyed in the in the Roland Moor, and we decided to step off. So they had to play off the top kind of thing. They couldn't drive us all over the park. Mm-hmm. And the referee just totally ignored that rule. And we got driven off the park everywhere. And on the touchline, our, our coaching staff, they just were going crazy. Thought they were going to have a sort of heart attacks and stuff like that. But <laughs> it, it is what it is. The, 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 the result on the day was fair. Uh, but if you look at some of the players, young players that we had, I imagine that was a good learning curve. For some of them, like Sir Floody and Tatey and Jeff Parlin and things like that, yeah. And then moving forward for yourself, you're um, you're, you're not far off your first Saxons call up. So, so how was that for you? Yeah, I mean, the, I think it was the it was the season after that um, got called up the end of the season. Um, for that, it'd been a reasonably strong strong season for me. Started the majority of the games. Um, uh, so yeah, and but the only disappointing thing was this: the the Churchill Cup was in England this year, that year instead of sort of the usual getaway trips to Canada or somewhere glamorous. We got stuck at Heathrow, 
So <laughs> we were in the Hilton at Heathrow. Fair enough, playing at Twickenham and, uh, and things like that. But I, w- I would much prefer the Toronto trip or something, something along those lines. But uh, yeah, obviously, uh, it was my dream to represent my country. Um, and um, Goddess uh, was sort of involved in all three games that we played against Scotland Island and the final against New Zealand, Maori. Um, but this, I, I put that good season down to a the club decided to take me and Johnny Golden away to a, a thing called Irans in New Zealand, which is International Rugby School of, uh, of New Zealand. So they flew me, Johnny Golden, and Peter Walden, the coach, okay. out, and we did a four month pre pre season out there, sort of getting taught off Sean Sean Fitzpatrick, um, Angus McDonald was there. Uh, there was a load of New Zealand legends. The no, oh, what was it? Uh, the the number eight legend is called Bill. Is he Bill? Someone. Can't remember. Um, there was, and that that really um, set me in good stead for that coming season. I, just, I I hit the season really fit, rolling, ready to go, and uh, just went from there. And I've, um, in both me and Johnny Golden, uh, did really well that season. So, um, uh, yeah, the 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 Churchill Cup itself, um, I think it lasted two two and a half three weeks. Um, in London, and it was tough. It was tough. We were there was me, Lee Dixon, Phil Dowson um, from Newcastle, and then the rest were London boys. So uh, w- what used to happen was we used to train, and they all used to shoot off home to their houses, and then report back in the morning for the team meeting and stuff. And we were almost stuck um, in the hotel by ourselves. But you kind of make good go to training. The training was at the Chelsea football. Um, Chelsea football uh, training paddock, which was an eye opener. Um, and then uh, sort of, yeah, it was, it, it it was what it was. It was it was enjoyable. Uh, during the summer, uh, we won it. I'm very proud to have won it. Um, and then sort of moved on. And what what's it like? What's the difference training with that kind of international group with a lot of lads who would go on to become full internationals compared to back at Kingston Park? Ah, you're back. Ah, yeah. Sorry about that. That's all right. So you just sort of said about the um, the difference between playing England Saxons with those boys and um, and the Falcons. Yes. Yeah, I mean that the the it was international level, obviously, but the the players that we had in that squad weren't Saxon players. They were up and coming um, England international players. We had Cipriani. Saki Bartley, Haskell, and Tom Croft, like those boys, are well all amazing England England international players, and they sort of raised the bar on training, the intensity, sort of the skill levels, everything, and it was a good learning curve for me. I learned sort of what it what it takes to be, or tr- tr- what it takes to be at that level, and the standard of training it was, and I learned a lot when I was with them. Um, and and the, the, the during the during the Churchill Cup, you just saw the difference in class between sort of sort of standard Premiership players and then that England elite, yeah. which was sort of Tom Croft won single handedly won us the Churchill Cup with like an amazing individual try. James James Haskell was in it. He then went went straight into the England England squad for the upcoming World Cup. Um, yeah, Cipriani was just sort of what he is and still is now. It's just got total X factor. Can see how to break defense or anyone else, and and does it straight away. So, yeah, it was it it was a brilliant brilliant uh, learning curve for me. Um, um, so yeah, and I really enjoyed my time there playing in front of in Twickenham in front of a load of people, and obviously winning it was uh, was a good finish to it. Yeah. Excellent. And um, coming back to the Falcons, so the Falcons from kind of 2008 to 2012, it's it's a strange period because there's a lot of guys leaving at this time. So Floody leaves, Tate leaves, Mike McCarthy leaves, Matt Burke retires, 
you've got all these great players leaving and the club kind of goes into a little bit of a decline over those years. So what, what was it like behind the scenes? I mean, you, you, you mentioned those boys, but I think the catalyst at the start was Wilco leaving. That was the big one. He was, at the time, Mr. Like Mr. Newcastle Falcons at the time, the biggest name in the club. Um, and he left just before this period. And look, it was a transition period throughout the club. Um, we had a load of managers over this period or directors of rugby or head coaches in and out. And there was not a massive amount of stability within the club. And that caused a lot of the good, talented young players um, to leave, play for, go, go, and, go, go and play for sort of um, better clubs uh, in the league and then uh, and crack on for England uh, England recognition, which pretty much all of them did. So fair play to them. But yeah, Floody left as well. Uh, Matt Tate, Jeff Parlin. Um, and, 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 if I was honest, the 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 people that were brought in, for whatever reason, didn't fulfil the potential that was leaving. So we were constantly sort of on the on the decline, um, and with the lack of stability within the coaching setup, it it, it was always going to happen. Sort of the decline from I would say two thousand and seven to twelve, when we eventually got relegated. I mean, I think we had six six managers between that time, which isn't really great. Um for one reason or the other. There was just they were in and out of the door and then they they wanted to put their own stamp on how to play and things like that. And it takes a long time to and uh, during that time did the club really have its own identity of how we played? I don't think it did. So um yeah, it was a difficult time for the club over that period and um eventually come twenty twelve we got we got uh, relegated. Yeah, and it was a um, it was a strange season. Just just looking back at the results of that kind of 2011, 2012 season, it started horribly. But after after Gary Gould comes in, yeah, he he nearly pulls off a miracle. Like the second half of the season compared to the first, unbelievable. Like, it's like chalk and cheese. So what what was the big difference there? Uh, I mean, uh, I think at the time Alan Tate, Alan Tate at the start of the season had come in. He um, he was a great great defence coach um, and then I would say uh, he he would probably admit this himself he got put into a very difficult scenario where he t- took over as head coach or director of rugby I can't remember the position he was given um, with a, 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 a very young uh, and w- weeks a, w- weakish squad and um, as a as as an inexperienced director of rugby, I think he struggled. Um, um, we couldn't pick up results anywhere, anywhere, and eventually it it it, it happened. And unfortunately, um, Tate lost his job. Um, Gary Gold then stepped in. What an acquisition he was by uh, Seymour, um, and he uh, he turned the club round. He, he gave all the boys a load of confidence and um, I think he just simplified everything. He said, and I remember certain sessions, he brought some players in, experienced players like uh, Stringer over. He was he was amazing what he brought, his experience and just know-how of how to play the game. But he, it was so simple. He just used to go in our half, kick the ball into their half and we're going to start making them make mistakes. And with those mistakes come penalties, and we had the best kicker in the game at, the t- at that time in Jimmy Gobbeth. And um, that's how we ground results out. And possibly the fans would say it wasn't pretty to watch, but it did a job. And we nearly, nearly did the great escape. I think we, we were down to play Wasps in the last game of the season. And um, we had to win by something like 24 points. And unfortunately, just didn't do it. I think we won on the day, but by about 12 or 15 or something like that. So unfortunately, we got relegated. But at the end, that that little period with Gary Gold, I learned a lot as well. And I think that a lot of the squad learned a lot. Um, 
from his management style, who we brought in. Um, I think you uh, do, yeah, with four, uh, 40 brought in defensively, taught us, taught us sort of a lot there. And, and it was just, it was hard graft in, in how we wanted to play, but um, it was effective. And, and all, across the squad, we we grew as a, a group of young players and that obviously benefited us moving into the championship and, and we, under Dean. And um, just, just to go back a little bit, because earlier on you mentioned that you had opportunities to leave the club and we've talked about the um, the kind of exodus of players in this time period. After you got your your um, your Saxons cap, did you ever think of, of, of moving on to a, you know, a so-called bigger club to you know, to, to take advantage of, of that and, and maybe kind of step on your international career a little yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, um, I just signed a, a contract there um, uh, just before. So the year before I, I got Saxons, uh, I think I signed a two or a three-year deal. And I had thought about it, but I was under contract and sort of I was I was reasonably happy there. If I look back now, Hindsight, yeah, possibly I should have moved on. I should have moved on and see if I could, I, I could have uh, cracked on and emulated what the likes of Jeff Paul and Toby Flood had done. But I didn't. Hindsight's a beautiful thing, but uh, I didn't, and I'm pretty happy with um, my career, my career as it as it, it panned out, really. And when it when it came time to to leave the Falcons. What what kind of offers did you have on the table, and, and what made you go to to the Trail Finders at the time? So I, um, it was quite quickly how I how I left the Falcons, um, and so uh, I left and I hung around Newcastle for a couple of months, uh, just finding my feet. It was a bit of a shock, but I, I found my feet, and uh, I was playing for a, a club called Darling Mountain Park, who. Um, were very was sort of a, a an up and coming local club. Um, they they are a dark horse at the minute in the um in the English leagues, and I think they will be the next Ealing Trailfinders, if I'm honest. But um, uh, so I went there, played there for a couple of months, and then um, Ealing Trailfinders came came up with an offer. They were still in National One, and but they were. Investing heavily in the stadium, in the squad, everything, and obviously we all know where they are now. Um, so I thought it was a good opportunity to go down and join sort of Wardy and 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 try and win some things down there and establish them and try and get them in the prem. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was a great club. It was a good time to to go down there. Really, um, I went halfway through their national one season. Um, and it was good. It was exciting. Uh, you go places that you you had never visited before. I'd never played before. I'd never played a load of clubs in National One. And um, it was enjoyable with a good group of boys. So, yeah, playing winning rugby. And um, I, I wanted to ask a question about the um, the boxing. Where, where did that come from? <laughs> right. So, uh, after rugby, uh, so I, played, I played for Elan there for two years. I'd um, left uh, left my wife and kids up in Newcastle, and I was living with um, uh, three other lads in London. Really, really enjoyable. But we, we sat around bored a lot of the time. I had done a little bit of boxing in Newcastle. Uh, pal uh, scrum off at Newcastle had taken us uh, to his boxing gym called Warren Fury, who's a very talented boxer at the time. He wouldn't. He would hate me saying that though. But he was. He was, <laughs> he was an exceptional boxer. Um, and uh, so I, I just went along for a little bit of fitness uh, when I was back up in Newcastle and that's all it was at the time, fitness and then started enjoying it getting better and better, doing one-on-one sessions with a coach called uh, Matt Jobs in Benwell um, and then I'd left to go to London and there in London I was looking for a a boxing a boxing club to, 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 to sort of keep fit it was almost a, 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 a well. It was a hobby at the time, and I was just sort of wanting to fill in my spare time. I found one wasn't great. I just used to play. There was no real coaching or anything like that with it. And then um, 
So I was just taking over when I was down there. But then when I came back, I really, uh, from Elan, I really had a hunger for it. And it was almost uh, a sense of I couldn't do certain types of fitness uh, through injuries and ankle problems and, and, and knees and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. boxing ticked up. It, it was there and I didn't feel any pain when I was working really hard with it. So um, I, I sort of threw myself at it. Um, I was still playing rugby, so I was um, at a local club. So I was just doing two, three sessions a week, keeping fit. And and then when I finished rugby, uh, my coach at the time, Matt, said, do you want to have a go at your pro licence? Um, so, yeah, I, I, I jumped at the chance. And I'd done, I've been doing okay against pros in the ring, in sparring, things like that. Um, so I jumped at the chance and, and went for it. But it was I was a typical rugby player in the boxing ring where in rugby you're told to lead with your head and sort of you, when you're clearing out rooks and stuff like that, you you throw your head in and then the rest of your body follows. Well, it's exactly the, the opposite in boxing, but unfortunately yeah. I couldn't I couldn't sort of grasp that at the early days. So I just used to lead with my head all the time. And uh, it, sometimes it, it didn't bother us getting punched in the head. I was just sort of battle-hardened from it, from rugby. And then other times get sort of sparked out. And But I, I, I enjoyed it. It was just, it, it was there. And it was filling a gap of that combativeness and com- uh, uh, the, the, the competition that I'd missed whilst I wasn't playing rugby day on day and training all the time so yeah that that uh, that was a brilliant part of my life I still go sometimes to the boxing gym I've, I've during I've had a couple of fights lined up before the Covid uh, pandemic hit uh, but unfortunately I haven't been back since the Covid Covid stuff's um, really kicked in and, and, and closed all the gyms but I'm, hopefully I'll get back into the swing of things and maybe have one or two more fights lined up for us and uh, what did the wife make of your boxing decision? Loves it. Do you know what? She loves it. She just, she she knows what I'm like. She knows that I'll just, even if she said, no, you can't do it or what have you, I would do it anyway. <laughs> so, um, but she used to come to all my fights and, 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 and really enjoyed it. Doesn't matter if I was winning or, 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 or getting absolutely battered all over the ring, she'd still cheer me on and loved it. And, and yeah, the, the, my mum didn't, didn't, particularly enjoy it and when we showed her videos of me getting battered in the ring of some big six foot seven bloke from Middlesbrough she, she wasn't too keen on that but apart from that everyone else was fine with it yeah <laughs> good I mean um, it, you're, you're at that stage now where kind of you're, you're going into the next phase of your life and what, what's interesting is we've, we've had guys on like Mike McCarthy and Jamie Noon who've said um when, when we retired, we, we didn't really know what to do and we, we felt a bit lost. Are you in that same kind of boat or do you do you have a good idea of what you want to do in the future? No, so I am I am owner of a facility uh, quite close to um, the airport in Newcastle and I've, it's got a pub on it. It's uh, got offices and a sporting pitch. So I run that day to day with a pub uh, and I've got about I rent it to different sporting teams from local football teams to um, uh, American Football University, Newcastle United ladies play there, um, things like that. So that fills my day pretty much uh, um, seven days a week organizing that. And then we've got the the pub. I've got a manager rest that works in there. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I'm doing at the minute. I run that and um, keeps me busy. Um, I, I had that planned wh- when I was down at Ealing for when I finished rugby. Um, but saying that, initially when I finished rugby, I felt lost. I felt like I wanted it was you. You were in a career where you had all the camaraderie of forty boys in and around you day to day. And then, and then the and you, you were training together. You were almost living on each other's uh, uh, in each other's laps. And and then it went from that to nothing. And you do you as a sportsman, you feel lost because it is literally just stop, click your fingers. You don't have that anymore. Move on to something totally different. And some people move into the professional world, and I imagine that is very very difficult. Um, 
a change a change in life because the difference between um, working in an office to running around a field with 40 other blokes and the banter that you have uh, with each other fighting on the f- on the field just it, it it's chalk and cheese compared to going into yeah. an office and the the transition must be very difficult um i didn't have that i sort of just j- j- day to day i'm my own boss i can do what do whatever i want uh in in those terms um so yeah I've, i found it reasonably difficult at the start and i missed the camaraderie of it all but it the the transition wasn't too difficult yeah is, is there ever any temptation to get back in the rugby through you know, no well, so i do i don't i've done I, I still do coaching um currently at uh gateshead rugby club uh brilliant rugby club love it up there i do tuesday thursdays um Obviously, we were playing Saturdays, but uh, I can't see any games on the horizon just yet. Uh, but great group of lads, love coaching up there. Um, um, really well-run club, so enjoy that. And I get the the the, the camaraderie that I missed during the, my professional sort of days. You still have that with um, when you're coaching up there with those boys. Yes, yeah. so I'm enjoying that. And what about your uh, young lads? Do you want to try and push them? Yeah, uh, so they 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 are rugby? sporting mad. Football, football and rugby. Uh, play for a local team called Red House Farm. Both of them, three nights a week, and then rugby two nights a week. Uh, well, Sunday mornings mini rugby at Northern, and then Thursday Thursday nights Northern. Um, so it almost comes Thompson taxis, and I'm just ferrying them around. All over, all over the place. Exactly what uh, sort of I giggle now because my parents used to sort of say, "All we are is a taxi service to you," and I would be like, "Yeah, yeah, whatever." I totally understand what they what they feel like now because me and my wife are just taxi services to school and back, and then sporting venues and back, and pretty much that's it. We get in at night, absolutely shattered from standing on a touchline, go to bed, and then it all it all starts over again. So yeah. Well, hopefully it'll be worth it if you see him pull on a Newcastle United or a Newcastle. Yeah, well, I don't think they would want to pull on a Newcastle United shirt. They support shockingly. They support man. The youngest supports Man City, and the oldest supports Liverpool. I wonder why. Wow. <laughs> I, I know I can't, but they they've stood by it. Um, total glory supporters. I know. I was trying trying to force them into the Newcastle United route, showing them sort of what I grew up with with the Keegan eras and. You score three, we score four, and that sort of talented bunch and saying, "Look, you want to support this team," and then you watch Newcastle United draw one all with Newport County away, and it doesn't sort of tick the box for them. So they're like, "Now nah, I'll just support Man City and Liverpool." So wow, Liverpool, I can at least understand. And uh, he, he's a bless. He's just a glory support. He'll change soon. If Man United, if Man United win, he'll change, and he'll go go to them. But. Yeah, I mean, it, they're, they're both very talented sportsmen, um, but I would say they would probably err on the side of rugby when they get older because genetically they've probably got my size rather than a footballer's size. So, yeah. Good stuff. Well, we're almost wrapped up. We'd just like to finish with the um, the Ultimate 15, which, which is always a good bit of fun. So, um, this is the, uh, the the very best fifteen you've played with throughout yeah, your career. Yeah, right. Hang on. I'm just, um, so ho- hopefully you've had. A uh, good yeah, hang on. I'm just looking for it now. Oh. The, the amount of grief this has caused across Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever we've put. So this. I've got. I've got. Can I do a twenty-three? Of course you can. So I've so loose heads. I've gone with Johnny Golden. Uh, played with him pretty much all his Newcastle Falcons career. Top. Top, top loose head, but I was thinking about George Graham, but I've gone with Johnny Golden. Hooker was obviously uh, Rory Best. Um, tight head. Good. It was difficult, this one. But, I mean, there was Davy Wilson, Kieran Brooks and Mario Serta, but I've gone with Carl Heyman for obvious reasons. And then um, uh, second row is Mark Andrews. Obviously, he 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 was he was good at Newcastle Falcons. I didn't think we saw the best of him at the end of his career, but he was still an unbelievable player. Um, and then Jeff Parlin uh, in the second rows. But I just like to say, Scotty McLeod was there. 
when I was there and he was probably the most skillful forward I've ever ever played with line out technician everything he's obviously coaching up there now at Falcons um does a great job for them but he, he was see, he was close to it uh so he's always good yeah, on oh, yes well, so yes he is yeah very good <laughs> um Pat Lamb in the back row uh with Mark Wilson and Phil Dowson uh could have had Owen Finnegan in there as well um but uh yeah just just went with Lammy um Mark Wilson obviously Ultimate respect for what he's done, going going from sort of playing university in that one to then playing in a World Cup, um, uh, w- World Cup final, and still playing for England and going strong. He's superb. Um, scrum off Gary Armstrong. I had him at the end of his career, and he was unbelievable player. Uh, could have had Mike Blair as well. He was he was a top uh, top international British Lion, top player for Newcastle Falcons. Um, number 10, no guesses there. It was Johnny Wilkinson. Um, a winger. He used to play back row, but in the early career, he played winger, and I've gone with Epi Tayoni. Oh, he, he as a young As a young player, he would be, when he got the ball, he always excited me. He always used to do something, and he would be the last person you wanted to tackle or get tackled by, because he would just end people. Um, it, it, it's brilliant that Tom May, our last guest, put him as a six in his ultimate team. For yeah, him, yeah. That's I brilliant. mean, he, he, to be honest, you just wanted him on your field. At six, I would say he was so disinterested in lineouts, it was unbelievable. So I had to put him. He, just, <laughs> he did, didn't want to be in any lineout, any driving ball, but give him the ball in hand, and he was scary, man. Um, I could. I was thinking about putting Sonotti Sonotti in there as well. His feet are ridiculous. Um, some of his highlights real in your Castle Falcons is is just phenomenal. Some of the steps and the power he's got is amazing. Uh, Twelve. I'm not sure if anyone would pick him, but uh, it was Mark Mayer Hoffler. He, 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 he really sort of solid, dependable. Um, just did everything everything right. Never made mistakes. Uh, Thirteen was Matt Tate. Um, fourteen, uh, Inga the winger, Inga Twinger Marler, and uh, fifteen, Matt Burke, brilliant. And then on the bench, I've had uh, Scotty Lawson, quality player, one of the best throws the lineup ball uh, I've seen. Um, George Graham, Kieran Brooks, Doddy, uh, in the second row, uh, Mike McCarthy, Macca, Mike Blair, Jimmy Gopeth, um. The, sort of, I would put him above Johnny Wilkinson as a, a, a kicker. Of the ball did wonders for Newcastle Falcons, and then twenty. Uh, the last one would be Tim Visser. I thought I, will, I played with him at a young age, and uh, what a talent he was! He was so laid back; it was unbelievable. Couldn't be bothered to train or anything like that. But but <laughs> when he when he when he got the ball in space, he was unbelievable. He was, uh, I couldn't believe it. We had him on the podcast and he told us he tried to make him a back row yeah, initially. Yeah, so what, yeah. I thought they wanted it. I think it was because he had limited, limited running in the backfield. Uh, didn't want to work in a pendulum system or anything like that or cover, cover the full back, but give him the ball and he would, he would skin people and score tries for fun, which obviously he did for Scotland and in, in, uh, in Queens and Edinburgh and stuff like that. So, yeah, he was he was phenomenal. We had I felt sorry for him when he was at Newcastle because he was he was still very young. Uh, he'd moved over from from Holland, and um, they expected him just to be the ultimate professional from a young age, and it was difficult for him. Obviously, come over here by himself and. Yeah, I thought I thought the Falcons could have given him a bit more time and wrapped an arm around him and, and stuff like that and tried to make him happy, but obviously it wasn't that, and he wanted to try and play international rugby, so went to Edinburgh. But obviously, it's, it's gone very well for him. Yeah, very yeah, very absolutely. well. Absolutely. Um, no, that's a uh, that's a hell of a team, and um, I think what what a lot of the players have been saying when when they do this exercise is they realise kind of how lucky they are. They've played with. Some of these guys. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've been lucky enough to, uh, Newcastle Falcons to play with some absolute legends um, of the game. There's so many that I've, I could have internationals that I could have 
picked and uh, and missed out. But these these were the boys sort of that really stuck in my mind as for one reason or, or another for unbelievable talent, hard work, just top lads, what have you. So yeah. Good stuff. Well, um, that wraps us up for today, Matt. So thanks very much for coming yeah, on. Yeah, thank you very much, mate. You. It's been great having And uh, hopefully when all this is uh, said and done, we can get back to Kingston Park. Yes, and we can have definitely. A hopefully. Let's, let's, let's hope for people in the stadium in the new year. Um, Absolutely. Watch Fulton's in the Premiership for a bit. So, okay. Absolutely. Right, well, thank you very much. Until you then, too, keep looking yourself. And thank you. you. Bye-bye. Soon. So that wraps it up for episode 8. Many thanks to Matt Thompson for joining us today and telling us his story. Thanks again to everyone who has supported the channel so far. It's massively appreciated. Keep subscribing, liking, sharing and spreading the word as you all have been. And we'll see you guys next time for episode 9.